So, continuing with our pre-quantum ideas, what I'm going to talk about today is something called the Tiger Experiment, an experiment I worked on for many, many years. Tiger, right here. What does Tiger stand for? Tiger stands for Tracking and Imaging Gamma Ray Experiment. This is an experiment that this is a gamma ray telescope that I began in around 1990. And this is a, to, to look at gamma rays from space, you have to get above the Earth's atmosphere. And so this thing flew in space in 2007, and again in 2010. So we'll watch a little video at the end of the 2010 campaign. But before I begin, I just wanted to mention some of the other people on the program here. Dr. Alan Zeich, he's now a retired professor at UCR. Dr. Dipin Bhattacharya, he also works for the Riverside Community College at the Marina Valley campus. Dr. Jared Roberts, he was a student at the time, but now he's a research physicist in San Diego. And Eric Harris, who was the software engineer. So just wanted to mention those people. Just to remind you, last couple of lectures, we went through the photoelectric effect, where light comes in, kicks off electrons. We also went through the Compton effect, where the gamma ray comes in and just ricochets off. So there's a gamma ray coming out that had lost some energy, and the electron picked up energy. And here was our formula for the scattered angle of the gamma ray. And then when we looked at the probability of occurring, this photoelectric effect at low energies, it dominates. Then, as you get up to higher and higher energies, the electron, even though he's in an atom, he acts freer and freer. And so the, once it's free, it's the Compton effect that dominates. And so the Compton effect process then grows. And then, at, still at high energy, the Compton effect starts to drop back down, and you get something. The third one going up is called pair production, where high energy gamma rays can create electrons and positrons. Okay, so there's the processes right there. So what we wanted to do was build a telescope to look at this part of the spectrum in space. So how do we do that right here? Well, first of all, we developed something called silicon strip detectors. You'll see them in the video. And so what happens here? Gamma ray comes in. So here's some gamma ray right there. Now, most of them will go right on through, but every once in a while, one will hit uh, a silicon atom in there. Okay, and what's it going to do? This is up in the gamma ray part of the spectrum. It's going to Compton scatter. This is low on the periodic table. Silicon's pretty low. We want to promote Compton events. So what's it going to do? It's just going to scatter right there and head down right here. So this is my E gamma. And this is my E gamma prime. E gamma prime, right here. Now, the electron, the electron that got hit, right here, well, maybe I'll put that in blue. The electron get, that gets hit in this silicon, little thin sheet, it's only a third of a millimeter thick, it goes through that silicon, go, comes out, goes to another silicon layer, goes through another one, goes through a number of them, depending on, on uh, how, much, how much energy they have. Okay, so let's just say it goes down like this right here. Okay, so what do we want to do right here? Well, we want to get the location of where that gamma ray is coming from. What do we get? What do we measure? Well, we're going to measure a track and this scattered gamma ray is going to come down and hit a big bar. Actually, it's a whole array of bars of something called sodium iodide. So let's look at the scattered gamma ray coming down first right here. Here's the scattered gamma ray coming down. It runs into here. First of all, <clears throat> this one has lower energy than this. So first of all, the energy is a little lower. This is quite dense, so we want to promote the photoelectric effect in here. And so that means all of the energy of this goes into kicking the electron off 
and you get a little electron gets kicked off right here. But remember, this is a scintillator, which does what? It takes that energy, of that kinetic energy of that electron, and turns it into optical photons. Optical photons go down the bar, right here, and hit that photomultiplier tube. This photomultiplier tube gives you a signal that looks like this. And if you take the area of this, it tells you how much energy came here. If you get the area of, on this side, it tells you how much energy you, you deposited there. And the area is proportional to the energy loss. So if we add this area up and that area up, we can get E gamma prime. So E gamma prime, E gamma prime is proportional to this area. Now we can calculate the proportionality constant because we can put radioactive sources in here and get the proportionality. So we know E gamma prime. Okay, now up here, if we look at this, <clears throat> these are called silicon strip detectors. We actually have 16 layers of them. They're probably about this big put together. And if we look at just one of these layers, if you just looked at one layer and make it a little thicker, remember these are a third of a millimeter thick, make it a little bit thicker right here. I'll make it at that thick. And when an electron goes through here, my electron was blue, so if we have an electron that ever goes through here, what it does is it kicks off, this is my Compton electron going through, it kicks off electrons in the silicon. And it takes about 3 EV to kick off an electron. That's to kick off one electron. <clears throat> and we might kick off, say, 30,000 electrons here and going through one of these little thin sheets. So you get about 30,000 electrons kicking off. Anytime you kick off electrons, you also have what's left over, and that's the silicon atom missing an electron. They usually call those holes because there are silicon atoms missing the electron. So you also get these, I'll just call them holes right here. Okay, so what it does is it just set, breaks them apart, breaks the electron off of the silicon atom. Now, these strips right here are actually what we call diodes. Now, I don't know if they went through diodes in your electromagnetics course right here, but this is the symbol for a diode right here. What does a diode do? Diode says, I only allow charges to move one way. If I, put, if I make this a plus and this a minus on a battery, charges move very easily this way. But if I make that the plus and that the minus, charges won't move. It's like a one-way valve. So what we do is we put the plus over here and the minus over here so charges can't move right here. And we turn this thing up so that you're almost breaking this thing down. So if you turn it up much higher, you get a cascade. So it's on the verge of breaking down. So now this is actually that right there. So when these electrons, when we disturb it and break these electrons, these electrons now are gonna head this way. These electrons kinda head this way. And the holes head the other way, holes because they're positively charged. These electrons come over here onto this capacitor, which means that's a plus, and we can, we can collect the charges because we know that V equals Q over C for a capacitor, or Q equals VC. We can measure the voltage multiplied by the capacitance. We get the charge. Since we know the each charge gives me 3 EV, then I can get how much energy was lost in going through this layer right here. So what I get over here is I get how much energy was lost in this layer, how much energy was lost there, 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 there. If I add them all up, that gives me EE prime. 
So that the sum of all these energies, I get E E prime. Okay, now not only do I get this, but if I turn this sheet up this way so I could look at it, you've got strips going this way on the top and strips going this way on the bottom, 128 this way, 128 that way. So when these electrons and holes go to this and this, this right here is one of the, like the top sheet, connects up to a line across this way. The bottom one connects to a vertical. So if, the, if it goes through, let's say the electron goes through right there, then you'll get a little pulse coming out here that collected all the electrons, and you'll get a little pulse over here that collected all the, the holes. And, you'll, and you won't get a signal on any of the others. So what does that give you? That gives you a nice XY position. So we get an X and a Y position on the silicon strip detector. So we get an X and a Y there, we get an X and a Y, an X and a Y, an X and a Y, and we know which board it is. So we actually get an, uh, an XYZ energy, XYZ. So we get a track, you get a little track going across there. Well, now we've got the two energies. We've got EE e prime and E gamma prime. Well, you remember over here, since we know E gamma prime, we know EE e prime and E gamma prime, and we know the mass of the electron, we can get how much the gamma ray scattered. So we can get, you notice the gamma ray was coming this way right here, and then it scattered went like this and then like that. So you'd call that theta, but that's the same angle as if I take this point and this point and draw a line straight up there, this angle is the same as that angle right here. So now we know this angle. Well, you notice we need to get this position. How do we get this position right here? We got the energy. Well, you notice if this signal comes out first and this comes out a little later, that means you know you were on this side. If both of these signals came out at the same time, you'd know it happened in the middle of the bar. So by the time it takes for the two to get out, we can get the position. And we can get it to, you know, within like this much. So we've got that position. We've got that position, which means we have this line right here. We also have this angle right here. Now, if you have that angle, you don't know if it came in this way or this way. It's down to a whole cone because the angle could have been theta on this side. All you got was the angle right there. So all you could say is it came from some ring in the sky right here. But that's the way all old gamma ray telescopes were. Tiger is the first one that tracked the electron. Now that you track the electron, you can tell where on the ring the gamma ray came from. Since it came this way, you know the gamma ray came from over there. If the gamma ray hit over here, the, the uh, electron track would be off in another direction right here. So now we get a nice, unique direction for each gamma ray coming in right there. Again, what we need is that position, that track, and the energy here, and the energy there, and we get a nice, unique direction for the incident gamma ray. Because what do we want? We want to get the direction of each gamma ray. Why? So you can make a map in the sky. So we want to get the direction. We also would like to get the total energy of this E gamma. We would like to get E gamma. Why? Because a lot of radioactive material in the sky gives off certain gamma ray lines. So we'd like, and we can get that just by adding up this energy plus all that energy. So that's just E, e prime plus E gamma prime. And we would also like to get the time. What time did this happen at? Now, when I say what time, I mean very accurate timing. Not only in seconds, 
but in not even in milliseconds, not even in microseconds, we'd like to get it almost down to nanoseconds, which means you need very accurate clocks. The reason why is because there are a lot of sources out there in the sky that pulsate. And if you want to pick them out, you better have very accurate timing so you can see those, those stars or those dead stars pulsating. Okay, and then outside of the whole instrument, right here, we have a thin, maybe about an inch thick of, it's called, a, it's a plastic, it's also a scintillator, it's plastic. Plastic scintillator. Scintillator. And what happens is, up in space, for every gamma ray that hits your telescope, you might get 20 protons, charged particles hitting it. What would a proton do? If a proton came in here, it would give you a track right on through, hit there, and just keep going. We don't want those because they, don't, they can't image right here with those. They're just protons coming in. We'd like to get rid of them, and we can't. It takes a lot of time to read out all this data, and we don't want to be swamped by stuff we don't want. So what we have is, remember, this thing completely surrounds the instrument, right? Here. Any charged particle that goes through this box produces a flash of light, and we have those photomultiplier tubes on these sheets right here. And if you get a signal in here, don't trigger the instrument for a billionth of a second because it's, it's a charged particle going through. So we get rid of all the charged particles by putting this in there. And so what's considered a good event? A good event is you don't get hit here, you get a track here, you get a hit down here. When that happens, you freeze all the detectors, read all the information out, it's almost a megabyte, and then get everything ready for the next event right here. But you've got to be fast because you'd like to do a hundred events a second. So it's, you, you know, everything's going real fast right here. You got a lot of data to read. Okay, so this will give you a little introduction on the instrument right here. I should tell you on this movie right here, in 2010, we went to Australia, Alice Springs, Australia. NASA has a balloon launching facility there. They've had it there for a long time. Uh, and if, you, if I draw Australia, let's just say there's Australia right there. Alice Springs is smack dab, pretty much in the middle of the continent. All the people in Australia pretty much live you know, on the coastline, you know, there's very few. This is an aboriginal center. Alice Springs is where we, we launch from. And uh, so I'll show you some of the photographs from, from uh, way out in the outback. It's pretty much in the outback out here. And when you're launching right here, uh, the winds at this thing, this is what we send it up by is a balloon. Now our balloons are very big because this instrument weighs about 2,000 pounds. Plus with all of the, plus the ballast, we have to carry a lot of ballast because this is a balloon and you want to uh, um, modify the altitude and stuff by dropping ballast. We might drop another 2,500 pounds of ballast 2,500. Then you've got the balloon. The balloon is about 7,000 pounds. And with all the rigging, maybe another 1,000 pounds. You know, so you're already looking at maybe 13, 14,000 pounds. Probably like two trucks or so right here that you have to lift by balloon right here. And we want to lift it up to very high altitudes. We'd like to go up to over 130 thousand feet. Now, there's not much, remember, what gives a lift in a balloon is you want to be lighter than the air. Well, at 130,000 feet, air is about 
two one thousandths of the weight it is down here. And so if you want to lift this kind of weight to that altitude, you need very, very large balloons. The balloons that we launch are so big, you could put Angel Stadium inside the balloon. I'm talking about the, the whole stadium inside the balloon. They're almost the size of the Empire State Building, the length of the Empire State Building. That's how high they are. The largest objects ever off the ground. Now, it takes NASA to launch these. We build it. NASA launches them. And uh, so we launch it from the airfield down there in Alice Springs. Now, when you get up to 130,000 feet, wind, there's not much air up there, but it goes very fast, maybe 200 miles an hour. Now, at 200 miles an hour, by the time you get up, it's six hours to get up, you'd be getting almost out of the country right there. And you don't want to dig this thing out of the Indian Ocean or the Pacific Ocean here. So every six months, the winds come down, they, they die down, and then they start picking up and go the other way, 200 miles an hour. And so you got a little window of when you want to launch. They call that turnaround. And so, but it varies. You can you can predict it within a month. So you have to be ready, and they have to send up these uh, weather weather balloons all the time to find out when the surface winds are dropping. When they drop, that's when we launch. We do have a so this is Alice Springs. We do have two downrange stations, one in the, in the west of Australia, one in the east of Australia, just in case, and then this is our telemetry range here, just in case we get too far. And on this flight from Australia, we actually went this way right here. And I flew down to our downrange station. This was in Longreach right here, picked it up. And it was uh, this balloon right here was up for about, 60 hours till we ran out of batteries and then it was eventually brought down by parachute came down in the outback right here and uh, so that's what this this uh, movie will show uh, and uh, well hopefully you'll enjoy this the movie now you can see our logo for the tiger instrument these are my colleagues right here this is the instrument. You notice everything is put into a can. Here is the silicon, one layer, and a zoomed-in picture of the layer. Here is the chips we had to develop to run that one layer here. We put four of these layers together to make the stack, and then we stack them all up. So this is just a picture of the stack, and it all goes into that little cavern, these big boards, all these boards are just meant to read out the signals from all that silicon. All goes eventually to a hard disk. Here's the bars on the bottom, the sodium iodide bars. And here's those photomultiplier tubes that go on the ends of those bars. We also put on some cesium in the sides just because we had some extra ones right here. These are cesium iodide bars. And then you can see the layers, the sheets around the whole thing that blocks out the charged particles. Okay, so this is just for triggering the instrument. We needed to make many, many boards for that. The trigger board, logic boards, many boards right here. So this is my trigger board right here. This is a telemetry board. Here's just some of the circuitry for it. Something called a scalar board, counts events. This thing corrects our clocks. And you can see all the boards that have to be made right here. Some of the command boards. We got magnetometers on boards. We've got tilt meters on board. We have uh, valves, pressure monitors, GPS stations. These are our battery boxes. We have ground support, atomic clocks, and rotators. Just some of the different pieces. And then this is us going to Alice Springs. This was February 14, 2010. 
Here's a map of, as I showed you before, of Alice Springs and our downrange stations. Alice Springs is actually known for Ayers Rock, which is about, uh, about a couple hundred miles away. This is the launch vehicle that we use, just showing you some, some strange pictures from the outback right here. Whether it's the big golden orb spiders, a bunch of caterpillars, moths, walking sticks, even the police. Uh, some wallabies. They have a lot of big monitor lizards there. This was one that we had to shoo out of the hangar. <clears throat> uh, these things can get quite long, up to three feet. Here's one of the roads. And this is a CIA base called Pine Gap. Uh, just some kangaroos, along with some more kangaroos. Okay, so for the first three months that we're there, we're just fixing problems. A driving, taking it all the way down there on a big uh, cargo container and driving it into the middle of the country breaks things. And so we have to fix things. And everything down there is is opposite of up here. Their power is different, their voltages, their plumbing is different, everything is different. And uh, so we have to fix a lot of the problems. Now we have to, this is the can. Everything is put inside a can because the harshness of space would just wreak havoc on us right here. Everything's painted white to reflect the, the light. There's our helium trucks for the balloon. And so the last thing you're going to do is what's called a flight readiness test, where NASA comes out, picks you up, takes you, weighs you right here, takes you out. This is ballast, about 2,500 pounds of ballast. It's just a sand. They take us out uh, on the outside the hangar, and we communicate to it. NASA communicates their own channels, and so we make sure there's no interference. Uh, so you can see above the telescope, there's many antennas and GPS devices. This, they're hanging the, the ballast underneath, and you got crush pad right here to break the fall. Uh, so now they're just getting it ready to test outside. Oh. These crush pad give you a nice constant force when you hit the ground, the crush pad underneath. You can see all these antennas hanging down below. This device right there was a, there was a uh, school. There was a school in University of New South Wales that wanted to test epoxies in space, and so they asked if we could, if we could uh, just put it on our instrument. We said that was fine. Right here. The only reason why I bring that up is because later, when the news brings up the University of New South Wales, that's what they meant—that little instrument that they we let them tack on. You notice this vehicle here? They have to put the the training wheels on the side so it doesn't knock it over because that's a good 5,000 pounds up there. So one thing they have to remember is when this thing goes up by a balloon is to let those things go. They don't want to go up with them. Okay, on board we have video cameras so we can look down at the Earth. So the last thing we need is to do what's called a magnetometer check. We have to go away from any me metallic uh, material, any magnetic material. This is all aluminum frame structure. 
and slowly rotate the instrument and measure the Earth's magnetic field for the onboard magnetometers. Once you get done with that, you can claim yourself flight ready. And once you're flight ready, then you can start going to weather briefings because you have to, they have to know that the weather, not only the up winds way up at the float are low, but the surface winds have to almost be zero. So here we are at weather briefings. Uh, just some advertisement for people in the town to come out. But this is our first launch and attempt. And it looks like today's gonna be flight day. Everything looks good and doing a hang test right now. Since we're, they're going to take our instrument out onto the airstrip that we flew in on, there's a lot of security there, so, so that's why uh, they have a lot of people there. And most of these people are NASA, and we're just waiting on what the weather's going to be like, so you can see we've got a lot of time on our hands now, once we're ready. So they pick us up at about 3 o'clock in the morning because they would like to launch at daybreak because that's when the surface winds are low. So we'd like to launch just after sunrise. So they'll drive this about, about a mile to where the airstrip is, uh, onto the airport. Once we're on the airstrip is when we'll turn on the telescope. We usually turn it on when you're up, at, up after you launch, but here we turned it on before launch. So I've got a radioactive source up there, just trying to do some last calculations. This is Bill Stepp, he handles the whole balloon launching facility there. We don't like this because we've been up for 30 hours. Now we got to do it the next day. But this is our third launch attempt on April 16th. Now this piece of plastic right there that you just saw is where they put the balloon on. So you can see it right here. Now the length of this piece of plastic is almost a quarter mile. So the balloon will stretch that full 
quarter mile. So they haven't brought out the balloon yet. I think they've got the the parachute box down there getting ready for the parachutes. These are very large parachutes. I guess we just got word that we are go for launch. So third time's a charm. So that's good. So they put explosive bolts above and below the parachute so they can blow them away. They don't want the parachute to drag it all over the place and they want to cut it away from the balloon. That little white spot there is a pie ball just to, to monitor the surface level winds. Someone else was just flying a, a regular balloon uh, on that day, hot air balloon. So the balloon is, is in this big box here. Looks like a big pink balloon, but it's not. It's just in a pink wrapper. And these balloons are only one use only. So if they get a little pinhole in them, they're no good. Now they only have to fill the tip of the balloon because as the balloon goes up, the outside pressure drops and it will fill up completely. They just need to give it about 20,000 pounds of lift. Connecting the balloon up to the parachutes. Now they're beginning to fill up just the tip of it. And it probably takes them about an hour to fill up just the end of the balloon. It takes us two, two helium trucks there. That's how much helium we use on this launch. They fill it through these tubes in the side. And just to give you an idea on the size of the balloon, this is just the very, very tip of the balloon. Now as you come down this way, this is all the balloon right here along the ground. This is still the balloon between the cars. Still the balloon. Still the balloon. Now you get to the parachute. And then there's the payload.
So they want to make sure when this thing takes off, this thing is vertical, exactly straight up and down when they release it off of the, off of the truck down there. That little arm will swing up when they want to relaunch it. So they're just finishing up the fill and then they'll tie off the tubes. Now they're going to launch it. They have a little collar around. They don't want the helium to get to the rest of the balloon until it's off the ground. So again, this would be taller than the Empire State Building by the time the bottom leaves the ground. They want to make sure they're exactly vertical. There's the onboard camera. You can see the shadow of the balloon going overhead. There was the launch. This takes about six hours to get up. These parachute uh, hanging below it will bring it down at about five miles an hour, much slower than a hang glide, than a regular parachute would bring a person down. And when that's all the way up, everything above the parachute will be a big sphere. It'll enlarge that big. Matter of fact, you can see it when it's 500 miles away. It's still that big in the sky. So. So it's starting to inflate a little bit more. Now it's getting a little bit bigger. It still has to be completely spherical. Now you can see it up in, uh, in space right there. It's dark even in the daytime up there. Here's all the data coming through. This is showing us launching out of the airfield. There it is. You wouldn't even see the instrument. It's just a dot below it. So there's a couple hundred miles away, you can still see it. So it's heading to the, uh, to the east. And so we're trying to get ahead of it. So this is uh, Jared and me. Uh, he drove across with a truck right there. And I flew to go to the downrange station. 
So it took them a few days to drive across. There's no roads except dirt roads from east to west on Australia. So, so there's the path. You can see as it changed altitude, it came back a little bit. This is me flying across Australia. There is nothing there until you get to the coast. But looking straight up, I could see it above me the whole way. And so there we rotate the instrument very slowly about once every four minutes. And so you can just see the rotation. And again, this is 135,000 feet right here. So I think I have 60 hours of this, this tape right here. There's Longreach where the downrange station is, so uh, I have a little place I can use to communicate to the instrument. So I have everything I need. Just the laptop there, I can communicate to it, and this other box, I can monitor it. Now you're right on the Tropic of Capricorn. Then it feeds. So wherever they were at, they would just stop, sleep there, and get going the next day. There's the track of the balloon. This is it coming down by parachute, takes 
quite a while to get down by parachute. These are very large parachutes. So Jared has since picked me up and we're both going out to collect it. The whole day. We had to turn back and go all the way back to where we came from and go on a different road. And now we have a plane, the pilot that knows exactly where it is, but we can't talk to him. So they're flying around up there. And they're not helping us at this point. This is where we're going. So we have planes helping us and we came to this big river. We couldn't cross it. We had to go around it. it took about a hundred miles out of the way. So all the ballast is empty. So now we eventually have to put it onto that truck. Get it upright. We didn't get here until fairly late in the evening, so uh, we were planning on just taking the hard disk out first, but it was just too late. So we're gonna put it on the truck take it back to Long Reach to the air, uh, airstrip and take out the hard disk there. The parachute is probably got blown away. It's probably about uh, a couple hundred yards away and the balloon, it could be 20 miles away. They put big rips in the balloon after it, it uh, releases us so that it doesn't drag around the world. So after having some truck problems uh, and getting it finally lifted, put it onto the truck. Then make it way back to Long Reach to the uh, airfield. So just getting the hard disks out. Okay, then we covered it. NASA actually brought it back to Riverside for us. 
we flew back to Alice Springs to pack up. Now, there were two other groups with us, one from the Marshall Space Flight Center in Huntsville, Alabama, and one from Berkeley, California. And Berkeley had, uh, was going to launch next right here, and I uh, put their launch on there just because it made big news back here in the, in the States. latest space dreams came crashing down in central Australia today. A giant helium balloon packed with expensive scientific instruments lost its mornings in high winds. As Anna Henderson reports, it cut a sway through an airfield and sent onlookers running for their lives. As the giant helium balloon was launched into the air, its precious cargo became a high-speed projectile. Unexpected strong winds pushed the two-ton platform of scientific instruments off course and onto a path of destruction. Justin Trotter's car was tipped over. He can be seen here running for his life. They started losing control of the uh, payload. We started to move the cars and just barely made it out without getting uh, without without getting smashed. The couple sitting inside their vehicle right next to his car can barely believe they survived. There was just lots of noise and we thought really thought we were gone. It was just an instance of uh, chaos outside. We were expecting to be wiped out. While Justin Trotter was inspecting the damage, NASA scientists were picking up the pieces of years of work. It's not clear whether anything can be salvaged. Everybody is feeling very down about it. A quick look showed that there were bits that were uh, in pretty good shape. But to be able to expect that to be put together within a month for another launch seems unlikely. You can see how large the balloons are when you get the when they hit the ground. So you get some scale here. So there's there's the size of these balloons. Organizers say they are relieved no one was hurt. We're very particular at the balloon launching station not to see this as a circus and invite people to come and watch the launches simply because of the risk factor. One balloon was successfully launched earlier this month and NASA is adamant it will have another ready for takeoff shortly. But after today's events, spectators will be told to stay away. Anna Henderson, ABC News, Alice Springs. So they had to wait. They finally flew a year later. So there's our altitude. You can see day, night, day, you come up, night, you go down a little bit. Here's the outside temperature. You can see the temperature gets down to minus 60 on the way up. Here we're looking at the outside temperature, the one on the bottom, and the upper ones with the inside. This is the difference between our clock and GPS time. Here's an event. That's what uh, one event would look like. Here's just a track going through the silicon layers. And here's a pair event. You get the electron and the positron. Okay, so that was the movie. <laughs>